again. Here we go, Tom. I'll let it into you to kickstart the meeting with, uh, with okay. Kevin. Pleasure, by the way, to have you all here today. So thanks. I'll add uh, to Andrea's thought. Thanks for uh, joining here, whether it's uh, live or whether you're listening to the recording, which we'll put out on the wiki, as well as we'll put a link on the uh, LinkedIn uh, website. Hopefully we'll have a just a quick, quick little thoughts um, here. We're still working on bringing together the trade finance and the supply chain LinkedIn uh, LinkedIn pages. Our wiki pages are merged together. For some reason, the old ones are still, we have them still out there, but we thought we'd closed them down. So uh, some people have signed up for that, but we're trying to get all that. So it's uh, squares away. It turned out it's a little bit harder than we thought it was going to be. So any case, that's kind of an update on, on the combination of our two groups here. Uh, today, we have an old friend from the supply chain special interest group. And so uh, Kevin Otto from GS1 has uh, joined us today to talk about some of the work that they've been doing around blockchain and seafood traceability. Mm -hmm. uh, Kevin, I met him at the Global Forum. How long ago was that, Kevin? Uh, almost two, over two years ago now, right? Yeah, yeah, it was uh, right before, not long before travel all shut down for, for most of us at least. <laughs> there, there you go, neither one of us got COVID from that, at least right. that I know of. Nope. <laughs> uh, and I don't think anyone got COVID from the Global Forum. And I guess I got that also the advertisement, Dublin, if you're interested in September is the next live Global Forum. So today we're gonna have Kevin uh, share with us uh, a little bit of thoughts Kevin has up on the screen here, antitrust caution. Uh, I don't know if we call it caution and hyperledger, but say the same antitrust uh, rules apply from a hyperledger perspective. Don't say anything of proprietary nature, don't collude. This is an open discussion here uh, for all of us. And hopefully we'll, again, this will be up as a recording and others will be able to see that there. So with that, Kevin, I will let you take it from uh, here. Maybe you could share, do you like questions along the way or do you wanna wait till the end? Yeah, I, I um, feel free to jump in as I'm talking. I don't want to just drone on the entire time. Um, so I think we have a manageable group here. So if you just kind of want to jump in and have questions as I go through, please feel free to interrupt me. I think that'd be fine. Beautiful. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. It's, it's all yours. All right. Thank you. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. I appreciate you all giving me the chance to talk a bit about the work that GS1 US has done really over the last couple of years as it pertains uh, to blockchain interoperability. And as Tom mentioned, uh, what a lot of the interoperability work that we've done has focused on the seafood uh, globally. And I'll get into a bit of a why that is here as I go through the presentation. So I think Tom did a nice job. Our, obviously our antitrust cautions jive, so I won't take you all through that. Um, but I just wanted to start off the conversation by talking a little bit about GS1 US for those of you who are either live on the line or listening at a later date uh, who may not know who we are. So we are a neutral, global, not-for-profit standards organization. Um, so I like to start off this conversation. I don't have anything to sell anybody on, on the line today. That's, that's not our role at GS1 US. Uh, we work with industries to develop standards that can drive cost and complexity out of, the, out of the supply chain. One of the main ways of doing that is to ensure that trading partners up and down the supply chain are speaking the same language. So, you know, examples I like to use is here in the US, we're very closely with Coke and Pepsi, right? So Coke and Pepsi, obviously fierce competitors, but they collaborate to compete on the use of standards, right? So there's no benefit in them creating their own numbering system to name their products electronically or name their locations. So they use GS1 standards uh, in their supply chains for that portion to ensure that there is no commonality of numbers that could clash in an electronic infrastructure. So, you know, Coke and Pepsi are both naming their products. Uh, and at some point, they're both going to name a product ABC123. Right? And so that's going to cause problems in the supply chain because all of a sudden you don't know what do you have a 12 ounce can of Coke, 12 ounce can of Pepsi. It's difficult to tell in an increasing electronic environment. So our goal is to take that, you know, ambiguity out of the supply chain and work with our members to ensure that they're not seeing that duplication. So really just creating that common language of how businesses talk to each other. 
So we work with all sorts of industries uh, in the U.S., about 25 different industries, several hundred thousand members of GS1 U.S. that we work with. Um, our four core industries here in the U.S. are food service, retail grocery, apparel and general merchandise, and healthcare, which encompasses uh, regulated healthcare items and pharmaceuticals. Uh, those are our core focuses. We actually have industry initiatives based on those four industries that come together to decide, you know, A, what are the supply chain challenges our industry is facing? And B, how do we deploy GS1 standards to help alleviate some of those supply chain pressures? So as I mentioned, we talk about ourselves as the global language of business, and that's typically put into three different dimensions, identify, capture, and share. So identify at a very basic level is the identification of products and locations unambiguously in the supply chain using our standards. So some of you may be familiar with the term uh, GTIN, global trade item number, which is the identifier for products, global location number, the identifier for locations, right? And that becomes kind of the bedrock of ensuring I know what a product is and where it's moving through the supply chain. And then certainly you need a way to capture that data. I think the way the, the mechanism that most people are familiar with is the trusty old barcode, right? So it's still the number kind of amazes me about 6 billion times a day, a GS1 barcode is scanned somewhere in the world. So uh, that's how a lot of the information is being captured around batch, lot, serial number, right? But it's not always just that barcode that you see at point of sale. You know, it could be things like RFID chips as well that are using GS1 standards. And then obviously you need a mechanism to share that information with your trading partners. And so we have a mechanism, not just for sharing the traceability data, which I'll talk about here in a bit more detail as we go through the presentation, but also product master data. So we have a, a system called the Global Data Synchronization Network, our GDSN. And I apologize at the top for all the acronyms. It is like a different language. So please stop me if I rattle through one you're not familiar with. But the Global Data Synchronization Network is uh, something that both data providers, so manufacturers, for example, and people who need access to data like distributors or retailers can plug into to share standardized data about the attributes, weights, dimensions, images, allergens, nutritionals, and the, like the information is standardized. So it's more easily digested into various systems that are plugged in as opposed to kind of it being a free for all and everyone setting up their own way of sharing that information. So that's just a little bit about how we identify, capture and share in the supply chain. Kevin, real fast on the uh, sure. global data synchronization network. It sounds kind of like an EDI band type of idea you're providing. Sort of. So you can still, we still leverage EDI. So um, it doesn't replace EDI, but yeah, it's, it's a mechanism for basically thousands of different attributes, uh, regardless of industry that can be shared from that data source to that data supplier. So yeah, it's, it's very similar. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so a little bit just kind of around the role of standards in blockchain and GS1 uh, started, GS1 US specifically started looking at blockchain technology probably in 2017, even as early as 2016, uh, because I'm sure as all of you, and I'm preaching that acquire quite a bit of hype around the use of blockchain and how it can help revolutionize some supply chains. And at the outset, we weren't sure, you know, is blockchain somehow replacing the needs for standards? And as our organization started to dig into this a bit, we found absolutely not, right? If anything else, it amplifies the need for standards, right? It's a ledger for sharing information, but you still need to actually be generating that visibility data to share with your trading partners. So we found that it was actually a pretty good spot for us to do some thought leadership and talk about how, you know, even blockchain, cloud-based, however you want to share traceability data that need to have the information standardized so it can be digested from one blockchain ecosystem to the next is paramount to make these solutions work. So as we started to dig into this, and it wasn't just us at GS1 US, it was actually, uh, we hosted several executive roundtables with uh, different member, members of GS1 US from uh, different industries. And the exploration of blockchain, its use was pretty singular. People were looking at as how they can enhance their supply chain visibility and traceability. Um, they understood that standards were going to be necessary because the key theme we kept hearing from our executives is we don't want vendor lock-in. 
in other words, I don't want to be forced to join a particular technology simply because the retailer that I'm selling to is using it and that's what they're demanding. We want to make sure that there's interoperability between the ecosystems. So I have a choice. I'll share the data, but I like to choose the solution partner and the technology that underpins it and who I'm working with. So we started to get quite a bit of questions from our industry executive members around how we can make that work. And so that kind of leads me to how we started our interoperability pilots. So we kind of put this, uh, we said, very basics, how are we going to crawl to start uh, this discussion with industry? And again, like I said, if you have any questions as I go through this, feel free to stop me. The way we approached our interoperability pilots at the outset was first to work with solution partners, right? So we didn't bring in end users right away. We didn't bring in the people who are actually using technology. We brought it on to people who were developing the technology. And, and we basically created a system where all these technology partners were going to play a role in the supply chain. And we generated dummy data to share uh, between different blockchain ecosystems. So uh, the idea here was, can we use uh, electronic product code information services, which is a GS1 standard that I'll get into here in a bit more detail, but it's essentially the what, where, when, and the why of the supply chain in standardized data. Um, and can we use that to help stitch together these different traceability events across different ecosystems, both blockchain and non-blockchain traceability systems? And so what we, what we realized is yes, this can be done, right? So using electronic product code information system, if, as long as the data is standardized, uh, it doesn't matter if it's blockchain, non-blockchain, you know, Hyperledger versus another ecosystem, the data can be shared as long as it's standardized. That's what allows it to be digest digested downstream by uh, other trading partners. Um, and so what we realized what is, is really needed is kind of what data needs to be shared, right? That's kind of the bigger piece of the puzzle here. I think most of you who have worked a lot closer in the technology than I have say the technology works, it, it can be done. You can make it talk to each other. The bigger challenge is what data are you sharing and when? And that's a lot of technology discussion as much as the industry discussion. And so just a little bit more about EPCIS, and I can share some information from our website about this, right? This is another global standard that is specifically around creating and sharing visibility data that you can see the physical flow of products through the supply chain. So like I mentioned, it's the what, where, when, and the why of the supply chain. What is the product? Where is it today? Where is it flowing? Uh, and why is it moving, right? A purchase order was created, right? There's, there's some type, we need to destroy per product for some reason, right? So why, why is what's happening in the supply chain happening today? We've created a global language that allows you to share that data in a standardized fashion so that it means something not just within your four walls, but as the information flows downstream to the next person in the supply chain. And a bit about uh, the benefits of EPCIS, and I'm not going to get into a ton of detail on the standard itself, um, but again, as I mentioned, it is global. Um, it allows for a more holistic view of the supply chain than the way a lot of companies do business today, where you, know, you might be able to see one up and one down and not really concerned with you know, three steps down the supply chain, where your product is or you know, where it's going. Uh, we know that a lot of the blockchain implementations that we've been talking to trading partners about is about getting that circular flow of data that I can see, you know, where my product went, where is it selling, why isn't it selling, so that I can make more informed decisions about how I drive cost and complexity out of the supply chain. So having this standardized language that flows all the way around allows for that kind of circular flow of data, uh, where if you have a bunch of organizations that ingest the data and have to do some type of translation to make sense of it and then send it down the line. The next person's supply chain has to do the same thing. You're really just adding a lot of cost and complexity in the supply chain and not getting anything valuable out of those efforts. And that's kind of what we're trying to get to past here with the use of EPCIS. Kevin, real fast. Yes, sir. Maybe you're going to talk here about this. Uh, is EPCIS stand on top of GTINs and global location indicators and barcodes? Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, part of EPCIS is sharing GTINs, is sharing GLNs. Um, it's also sharing some information that's, you know, what we call critical tracking events and key data elements. And some of those key data elements may be something as simple as using the ISO format uh, for time. 
timestamps, that sort of thing. So not necessarily our standard, but an important piece of those key data elements that need to be shared. But yes, absolutely, Tom, at its core, uh, you can't do this if you're not using GTINs and GLMs. That's, that's absolutely fundamental. Okay, good, thank you. Good question. And so this just kind of gives you an idea of this crawl phase. And to the right, you can see the uh, solution partners that we worked with uh, in this first phase of the interoperability pilot. We had a uh, right bio, which is, I can't really call them a startup anymore. They've been around for a few years, but a smaller blockchain organization does some really great work that we've worked with. And then certainly some larger ones that I'm sure you're familiar with, SAP, IBM, Food Trust. Um, and then Food Logic actually is a food traceability program that is cloud-based, so it's not blockchain at all. Uh, and the reason we brought them in was to prove that it really doesn't matter which technology is underpinning your particular platform. It's about the use of the standardized data that's going to allow uh, this information to flow up and downstream. And so, you know, this is kind of a perfect world scenario, the way that we did this, right? So. Uh, we had all the information we needed. Uh, it was all dummy data, like I mentioned, that we generated. And we asked all of the solution partners to take on a different role in the actual physical supply chain. So, for example, you know, in this ripe IO was the packer and the shipper, right? So, and they, we created the dummy data and shared it amongst the trading partners and said, yes, we can stitch together these traceability events because, excuse me, the data is standardized. <laughs> And so I, one of the things that was abundantly clear from the start, and this, to be honest, was not necessarily a surprise for us. A lot of this effort at, at the crawl stage was around proving what we thought we already knew, right? And so there's really a two-part solution. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit of feedback here. Um, we The technology, right? So, and I think this is the part that most of you are ever, you know, much more familiar with than I am, right? So understanding the technology, how it works, can you share standardized data uh, in, in the blockchain ecosystems? I think we kind of knew going in, the answer was going to be yes. It was just around how difficult is it going to be? Um, and so we knew that using global unique identification was going to be core and using EPCIS uh, data. And then the other things to talk about there is just access and authorization, who has access to the data and when, and creating a network governance model, uh, which again, even that could be part of more of a, a industry discussions in some instances. The bigger challenge is the business side of it, right? So it's not about what we see in kind of the 20 and 80 here, um, let me go back there. 20% is understanding the technology and how it works. The 80% is, okay, you've now decided as an industry that you want to share traceability data, right? If you have 10 different steps in the supply chain and 10 different players, I'm willing to bet that you're not only going to get 10 different definitions of what traceability means, but you're certainly going to get different perspectives on what data is necessary versus what data you might want to keep as proprietary, right? And so that's, I think, the bigger part of the discussion that industry needed to, it needs to have is what do we need to share when and with whom? And that's going to be different from one industry to the next. And so that was one of the things as we went through just even this initial part we said yeah we can figure out this technology piece but the business part of it is is a much bigger solve yeah hey uh uh kevin if there was a question in the chat here from dennis oh sorry yeah it's dennis. a little hard for me to see the chat when i'm in presentation but... yeah no no worry so that's why i'm bringing it up here what if what if i have multiple components of this particular product with a barcode and maybe dennis can elaborate on that since i'm not exactly clear what you're asking dennis I just was thinking uh, about a medical device, uh, you know, for example, on the, uh, this, on the dispatching on the, on the package, you have uh, one barcode, but if you open it uh, for the traceability reasons and for the interoperability, you, have, you may have multiple components. And uh, it can be before the production or before the utilization. Uh, that was my question. C can you expand the bar barcode? Uh, I mean, uh, temporarily. I mean, with uh, if, if you need it. Yeah. I, so there's different barcodes that are used at different points in the supply chain. So if you think about product flowing through a warehouse, there's typically a barcode on the box that's going to be scanned there. And then if you're breaking down that product at the warehouse to ship individual units to a retailer or to a pharmacy, uh, that's where you can scan the individual unit barcode. And each one of those 
are going to have different information on them. Some of them, you know, one's going to identify the case, the other is going to identify the sellable unit. Um, so it's actually pretty common that when you talk about things like inner packs and cases and even pallets to have multiple different barcodes, it's just about where is that particular barcode relevant in the supply chain. Now, when you're talking about components and maybe there's several components of one product, like physical components, uh, what typically you're trying to scan there is the actual selling unit. So you may not capture all the data for every component, but the idea here is as that information is being shared throughout the supply chain, that is still being captured upstream in your system. So you know all the components of that particular product because they've already been scanned at different points in the supply chain. You don't necessarily have to scan every barcode that's on there, but it's a good question. Um, and that's where uh, different industries and actually the um, some of the guidelines that I have here, you'll see there's a healthcare guideline around uh, traceability for pharmaceutical on there talks about which barcodes need to be used and when in the supply chain. And it again goes back to those industry discussions that need to happen to figure out how that works. Well, thank you very much on board. Sure. And so, you know, what we realized again was going to be the bigger challenge here is getting industry to talk to each other and come to a set of agreements. And so, you know, we've got some documents here that uh, GS1 has worked on, obviously just around EPCIS and what it is and how to use it. But on the right, you can see we have, as I mentioned, uh, a healthcare guideline around compliance with the Drug Supply Chain Security Act, which uh, GS1 standards are heavily used in helping uh, companies come to compliance on that regulation. Uh, but again, that was industry coming and sitting down deciding, hey, we would like to use GS1 standards to make this work. And here's the data we have to share. So it's a pretty comprehensive guideline uh, that took quite a while to pull together. And again, that's where you need the willingness from industry. And then the reason that we had actually decided that the next portion of our pilot was going to be around seafood is because that global dialogue on seafood traceability already existed, right? Industry had already sat down and come to those, those uh, conclusions around what they wanted to share and when. So we already had something that was agreed upon and it made it a bit easier for us to test the hypothesis. Yes, if we have this information, we can fairly seamlessly share data down the supply chain. And, uh, and I'll add to what uh, Kevin's talking. We had uh, folks from Global Dialogue and Seafood Traceability on, on one of these uh, calls for the supply chain uh, a couple of years ago. And I think I remember Kevin, them saying it took them like five years yeah. to get that, get that standard nailed down for seafood traceability. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, you know, and I think the, the uh, DSCSA one I just mentioned was a couple of years for us to pull together too, right? And um, that was, a, that's an even smaller lift because just the way the pharmaceutical supply chain is structured, you've got bas basically three wholesalers that do about 95% of all the business here in the US. So it's a lot less cor cor corralling than there is in the seafood space. So yeah, it, when you're talking about getting all these different players and sometimes competing initiatives, it can be difficult to come to some of these conclusions. And that's, that's a real challenge. Um, so, you know, what we realized, I think, at the end of the first part, and I'll get in the second part here in a moment, was that data sharing, you need the specific event data requirements from industry. Global unique identity is absolutely paramount. You're not going to get anywhere without it. And that's why you need kind of that, that common language. Otherwise, you're just going to be, you can share data all you want. If no one can adjust it and understand it, and it's pretty much meaningless. So, we, you know, we did what we realized is as we were going through this, we we're actually talking a lot about blockchain because we realized it didn't matter what the technology was. Um, but because the impetus for digging into this uh, was around blockchain, just kind of this slide just gives you an idea of where we see GS1 standards kind of sitting, right? So you've got all these different uh, systems in the supply chain that generate data, but that data needs to be valuable, right? It needs to be able to be translated. It needs to be understood. It needs to be accurate. And that's where GS1 standards can help uh, with the standardization of that information. And then that can be written as a ledger entry to, to blockchain or to other technologies. So then the next part, and we we're still crawling here, we tend to crawl phase one and crawl phase two because we were trying to you know, be really diligent about the way, excuse me, we approach these, is now we thought it's time to bring in end users and actual supply chain data. So as I mentioned before, we kind of use dummy data a perfect world scenario. We know that's not how the real supply chain works, right? So actually having data from specific industry supply chains across different solutions so that we can do the same thing around trying to stitch together that traceability, but doing it with actual data in the supply chain. 
and again, we went with seafood because we already had that standard that had already been developed by industry. So we did add another solution partner for this part of the project whole chain. Otherwise, the, uh, the technology providers remain the same from the initial portion of the POs. And then you'll see the uh, the industry players that we added. So Seafood Tire Union, Bumblebee, Norpac, Beaver Street Fisheries, uh, Walmart, and the Institute for Food Technologists. So actual industry that helped us you know, share data uh, to you know prove out what we had seen in the first part of our hypothesis. And certainly, the global dialogue for seafood traceability was a huge component of the work we did. Uh, we also used components of the Food Safety Modernization Act, uh, proposed Rule 204, which I believe will be getting the final rule in, in November of this year, which is again around uh, data sharing for food traceability. Um, so we wanted to use some components of that as well. And I won't go into a ton of detail on what the global dialogue is. Like I mentioned, it was industry coming together and talking about what data needs to be shared throughout the supply chain. Uh, it is internationally agreed upon what we call key data elements. So that means what are the pieces of information that need to be shared at each critical tracking event or CTE. And critical tracking events are things like commissioning of a product, transformation of raw raw materials into a new product, shipping of a product from point A to point B, right? So those are the key events where you wanna be capturing information and they've defined what those key data elements, those pieces of information need to be. Uh, benchmarks for verifying data validity, validity, let's try that again. Uh, and, and so these are other things that you gotta think about as well, just because, just because you know, as Tom mentioned, it takes five years to come up with this guide, you know, you can, you can bank on other five years or more before you have full implementation. So another challenge that you have with industry is actually setting up milestones for when these things need to start being adopted. Otherwise it can be very difficult to get traction. Yeah, I'll, I'll add a, a two, my two cents on it. I really like the work that they did and you can find their documents out there, go to Global Dialogue and Seafood Traceability and uh, just do a Google search and you'll, you'll find it. But they have some very nice documents that I've used for other projects, just as kind of a model for these key data elements and critical tracking events. So maybe it may be something not intended, but I think they did really nice work that can be applied elsewhere. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and I think that's important as your you know, industry members are talking, what we continuously tell them is just because you don't have guide, you're not necessarily building from scratch, right? Because there are some really comprehensive guides that are out there um, and at you know, 30,000 feet, it's still about sharing product data with your trading partners, right? So obviously there's nuances you change from seafood to like the, I talked to somebody about the wood supply chain yesterday. Yeah, there's gonna be differences, but uh, it's still about sharing accurate product information. So there's, there's the, the global dialogue is a great document to use when you're having those conversations. Uh, and same with the, you know, the FISMA 204, I won't go into a ton of detail yet because the, the rule hasn't even been finalized yet, but it's about how can we leverage emerging technology like blockchain to make this food supply chain safer um, and using kind of the same, the same idea of key data elements and critical tracking events. So um, the only real difference I think, as I mentioned in phase two of what we did here is we had an actual application standard that we were using um, and we were following specific data and a specific use case, right? So can the technical provider share the information across platforms in this more real world use case? what we found was yes but there were challenges right and so this was this also was not unexpected um, so what we realized as we went through the second part of the supply chain is there are several key takeaways to what the challenges were in industry so I, I, a number of them i touched on already and i won't go through uh again but around that industry specific standard is, is core right that's 80 percent of the challenge you've got to do that what we realized is even with you know, so uh, end users who have been leveraging GS1 standards for years in their supply chains, there were still gaps, right? There were, they realized there were parts of their supply chain where they were not capturing all of the key data elements that they should be in order to really have holistic traceability. So I think a lot of the people that were part of this pilot realized they have some in-house cleanup to do to make sure their processes are capturing all of the information at the relevant times. Um, and, and that again, it's, you know, these, these are evolving processes. So even if you've been doing this for years, you can expect to find some of those gaps. 
Uh, there was also just master data elements. So around the, the not just the dynamic traceability to information that you need to be sharing, but there were gaps in the actual product master data and how that was being shared. And that's important. You need that product master data really to tie together what the product is that's flowing through your supply chain. So when that's incomplete, it causes challenges in the visibility of the products. Uh, one thing that was... Kevin, before you go on there, yeah. there's a question here specifically about master data from Louisa. Why, why using master data and not transactional data? You're using both. Right. Okay. So I, 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 if, if I understand the question correctly, the transactional data being, um, you know, the GTIN, the GLN and where the product is flowing. But there's also a host of attributes that people need to have in their systems to actually more effectively ship and receive products. So think about master data like the tie high of a pallet or the weight of a product. Right. That's information that is generally shared outside of the transactional visibility data but it's still information that is important to the flow of goods through the supply chain. So they kind of work in conjunction with each other. You've got that global data synchronization network that helps you more seamlessly share the product master data. And then the EPCIS standard, would helps, which helps you share that transactional visibility data. Okay, maybe that's the, the key right there. So you're using both. Louisa, does, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Beautiful, okay. You, you hit it there, Kevin. <laughs> Continue on. <laughs> thank you, thank you, yes. And please, like I said, jump in if you have any more questions, I appreciate it. Um, one challenge that we see a lot of is upstream in the supply chain. The further upstream you get, the less adoption of standards and just the, the less concrete the practices are around traceability. And that's a challenge. Everyone's after you know, full supply chain visibility. So for example, with a lot of the seafood work we did, right? So as you get onto actual fishing vessels, the way that they track, if they're tracking at all, some of the visibility data is not fully formed, right? So there needs to be the uh, more pervasive use of standards upstream in the supply chain. And that's where we need to work through not just those solution providers you see as the multipliers, right? The people that, that are kind of talking about this every day, but also work with our core end user members to make sure they're driving this practice through the supply chain, because that's a major challenge. If you wanna get full supply chain visibility, but you're not capturing the actual visibility data at the very source of where product is harvested, then you're starting out behind the eight ball. And it's difficult to kind of stitch together that information if it's not, if it doesn't exist at the, at the outset. Um, and so that was one of the challenges. And one of the other challenges, honestly, that's kind of a bit about an R purview uh, that was more pervasive than we might have thought was just connectivity issues, right? So yes, I'd love to share this data, but I'm on a fishing vessel in the middle of Atlantic. I don't exactly have the best Wi-Fi out here. So there's, there's other challenges that industries, and the same thing goes for, you know, farms in remote areas, even of the U.S., where some of the, the um, you know, broadband access and things like that are not as uh, prevalent as you'd like them to be. And sometimes that creates challenges in sharing this visibility data. And what a lot of people do is end up doing it later in the process. And there's a chance that it's not as accurate if you're not doing it right at the source. Hey, so Kevin, those were some, yeah, go ahead. Quick question about inputting the data from the fishing boats and other upstream places. Are you still seeing it mostly done manually by, by human or are you seeing more adaptation of using RFID or Bluetooth, other sensors, things like that? At, at present, it's more manual. Okay. When you get when you get to that point, I mean, yeah. obviously, we would love to see it move towards more, you know, something RFID, or to be quite honest, even if it's not RFID the, on the actual fishing vessel, mm -hmm. what we're seeing is a lot of solutions, be they blockchain based or not, mm -hmm. um, have some pretty, uh, pretty cool apps that mm -hmm. will allow you to upload EPCIS formatted data on your smartphone. So oh, it's not, you know, it's, it's not Bluetooth right at the source, it's, but it's at least allowing you to get that data. But again, what we're seeing is for, for a host of different reasons, kind of a lack of enforcement mm -hmm. of that upstream. And that becomes a challenge. Makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think those were kind of the key takeaways uh, from what we saw in our couple of different pilots. I mean, I think at a high level, the technology works. The ability to use standards to share data from one ecosystem to the next works. I've said it you know, num numerous times and it bears repeating that chat, the biggest challenge is industry agreement. And to Tom's earlier point, that can take years. 
And you at first need the appetite to even start the conversation. So, you know, we've talked with industry around, do you need a specific traceability guideline for blockchain? And the answer seems to be no, right? I mean, the global dialogue was not blockchain based when it was brought together, but it can be used in blockchain. So I think the, the good news is you're not necessarily starting from scratch, scratch in most industries, but there's still a lot of work to do in the conversation piece and just the blocking and tackling to make sure that the use of standards is pervasive in your supply chain. So I think I've kind of hammered that point home that we make interoperability possible. That's kind of what we have, where we position ourselves in the blockchain discussion and other visibly platforms as well. Did have one other thing I wanted to do before I close it out and open it up more broadly to questions for the group. And Tom had asked me to touch on this when we connected uh, this was several weeks ago. Back in 2018, we actually started a uh, cross industry blockchain discussion group uh, that was focused on understanding how blockchain can be used in any supply chain, namely those four major ones that we work with in the US that I mentioned at the top, food service, retail, apparel, and healthcare, uh, because they were all kind of looking at it the same. They were all looking at it as how do we enhance visibility? You know, and from our perspective, the standards are industry agnostic. So you can learn from how something is being done in retail and translate that to the pharmaceutical space. So we set up a blockchain cross industry discussion group that actually went until the end of last year. So we got solved three years of discussions around blockchain and its potential in various supply chains. And what we did at the end of last year is kind of stepped it up to more of like a 60,000 foot view and changed the group a bit. So we're talking about supply chain optimization as a whole, not necessarily couched in one particular uh, technology, which is generally how we talk about the standards. We don't position it in one technology or another. Blockchain was just such a unique opportunity for us because there was so much talk around how it could help revolutionize supply chain that we absolutely had to take advantage of that. Um, but members of our various industry initiatives that I had mentioned participate in this group. I lead these calls on a monthly basis. And it's really interesting, right? We have solution providers, we have end users, big and small as part of the discussion, talking about the challenges in their supply chain. And as I'm sure you're all aware, they are many right now um, and how we can leverage GS1 standards. So encourage you if you're interested in learning more about uh, this group. Uh, again, it's not just blockchain focused anymore, but it is uh, blockchain certainly is still a component. So uh, if you're interested in learning more about how you can become a member of one of our uh, industry initiatives, I'd be happy to have those conversations with you. Okay. Is it, Kevin, is there a website for that or is this something they should contact you via your email? Um, you know, if you're interested in, contact me and, and in my contact information issue, you can certainly go to gs1us.org to read more about it. Um, but in terms of actually getting engaged in the conversations, we'll need to link you up with somebody from the GS1 US staff. So I can, if you reach out to me, I can put you in touch with the right people dependent upon which uh, industry you fall in. Great, great. Good. Well, Kevin, this, this, this has been good. I'm, I'm glad you, that there was some progress or some work. Thanks for sharing uh, what you guys have done over the last couple of years and giving us additional food for thought as we're continuing the evolution of adopting blockchain and supply chain and trade finance out there. So um, I'm going to open up for questions, see what else is out there. Thanks, folks, for asking questions. You can ask them in chat. I'll monitor those or just uh, take yourself off a of mute and you're welcome to uh, add in a thought there. So I'll give it a second. See, oh, Michael's already asked a question. Hey, Michael, can you describe the alignment between GS1 and ISO related and ISO related to quality, uh, portable mass and portable master data? Michael, if you'd like to share more on that, you're welcome to. I've just been learning more about GS1's work recently and uh, have been working with uh, the ISO 8000 groups under TC 184, SC4, and 5, and just uh, was wondering your thoughts on alignment of those, those efforts, because they seem to be addressing very similar uh, master data and, and transactional data. Yeah, I, I will say, um, I don't know all of those, those work groups specifically, but generally we have a whole team from our standards organizations, our standards part of our organization that actually sit on a lot of those ISO calls. 
Um, so we're actually part of a lot of those discussions for that reason. How can we make sure the standards are complementary and that we're not duplicating efforts? So I can't speak to those groups specifically because I don't sit on the, on those particular discussions. But I will say that we're involved in a lot of those TC, you know, name your <laughs> name your number after that uh, calls on a regular basis. So if there if there's specific questions around things that you think might might be duplicative, uh, certainly let me know and I can get in touch with our standards team to make sure that we have a voice in that in those particular groups. Uh, so Kevin, I've just taken a snapshot of your contact information. Uh, if it's cool with you, I'll reach out for you offline and uh, engage in a supplementary conversation. Would be happy to. Thank you. Good. Anybody else out there? I also, thank you for the presentation. Very much appreciated. Uh, I work for the IEEE interoperability for medical device in IoT environment. So we have been also discussing in the identity management uh, perspective. So, so you have uh, the UDI identities. Yep. And uh, in consideration with the whole identity management, how do you supposed to build the uh, traceability and the whole interoperability throughout the system, throughout the workflow, throughout the supply chain? And it's really very much uh, complimentary for me. Thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. Happy to share it. And like I mentioned, we have, you know, that whole kind of pharmaceutical side of the house uh, that hosts work groups uh, that, that's all, you know, UDI. And, and, you know, I have some colleagues who are much more well-versed in, in that world than I am. But we do have, you know, discussions around challenges and solutions in that space. So, again, if, you're, if anyone's interested in kind of getting involved in some of those discussions, please let me know. Thank you very much. I will contact you. Thank you. I'm going to ask a question here for Andrea here, since uh, we've merged supply chain and trade finance and they kind of go together here. Have you seen much use of the GS1 standards, taking it all the way to establishing some sort of, uh, you know, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to pay this, I'm going to pay off this note based on what I actually see out there happening in the, in the supply chain? Yeah. So it's, it's an interesting question, Tom. A lot of when it people, like I mentioned when people initially got involved with uh, the use of blockchain, it was around enhanced supply chain visibility. And where they started to gravitate after that was how can I deploy smart contracts um, to actually help with things like accounts payable and accounts receivable. So automating that process based on what actually shipped and what actually was received, uh, kind of mitigating the, the challenges around off invoice deductions because you, you, they say you shorted product and you say you didn't, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, I think people are looking at what are the financial implications of how I can automate some of these processes and then kind of redeploy that workforce to other parts of the organization where the kind of direct human intervention is actually necessary as opposed to where it can be automated. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but you are hearing a lot of discussion around that. I mean, it answers, it was answered from my perspective. You gave one example, Andre, I don't know if there's another one that you wanted to, to bring up there, if that makes sense to you. No, that's perfect explanation, actually. It fits perfectly into the world of open accounts. So we're tracking back the origin of a certain product and automatizing through smart contracts. That's a big fit. It's not related, basically, to structure trade finance. It's rather on commodity finance. That's where I see this fitting the most. But that, yeah, that's... Consider that's 90% of the global commercial exchanges is the pie is that big sorry yeah, Kevin, it, didn't want to interrupt you no 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 please please uh, like i said please jump in uh it's it's interesting as the conversation evolved you know it was really just about visibility but then when people realize like now that i have this visibility what other things can i do with it besides just knowing where my product is and why it's there right and so that's where people started to realize like hey i can use this to to automate a lot more processes than I might be able, that I may have thought of in the past. And that's really coming to the forefront as uh, the members we're talking to are de dealing with significant labor challenges right now. So they've got to find ways to automate processes where it's possible. And that's kind of one of the places they're looking to do it. Good. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Sure. Uh, any other questions going once, going twice? I have. So Kevin, uh, very interesting that you mentioned about this pilot and you mentioned about right, the quality of data. 
And I came across, I think, a pharma company and they were trying to map and have visibility of their supply chain. And they tried to use GS1 and they said that many of the data was not available. So wondering if in your pilot you have like statistics on the availability of that data, because I definitely agree we need to have a standard. And GS1 seemed to be very widely adopted by CBP, W3C, et cetera. And if, um, or maybe which industry you said that they're planning, you know, putting roadmaps for adoption, which one would you say that is the most evolved? It's a great question. Um, so I would say in terms of statistics around the adoption of standards, uh, we do, I know for a fact, have some information out on our website around adoption levels for food service. I'm not certain if we have, I, so just my background before I took on this role around blockchain and supply chain mobilization was on our food service team. So I'm more familiar with that work. Uh, I'm not sure if we have that data publicly available for the other industries. So I'd have to check. Um, in terms of which industries are more evolved than others, um, I think you, you see a lot more traction in food when it comes to the use of GDSN data, so that product master data, it's really pervasive. It's 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 necessary to, for example, for example, to do business with Walmart, right? You have to share that information. So when you have major players kind of putting that stake in the ground, that kind of drives a lot of the the adoption for food and CPG. So on that side of the house, uh, we see quite a bit. Now, when you go over to the pharmaceutical side of the house, specifically as it applies to the Drug Supply Chain Security Act and saleable returns of uh, pharmaceuticals. So you need to return to a wholesaler and that product is still good. It can still be resold. Uh, there's the adoption of GS1 standards for that particular process is extensive. That we have the whole guideline around the use of standards in that space. Um, so, and again, that goes back to the fact that we have relationships with the three major wholesalers here in the US. So certainly if, when you say there's gaps in the standards, that can be taken a couple of different ways, right? So is it the industry itself has gaps or is it just maybe particular trading partners that they're trying to obtain information of aren't adopting the standards? So I think that's one of those things that we could kind of bring to the discussions we have with industry to find out where those gaps are. Great, exactly. I think the problem is with the trading partners, right? How do you get them? They're everywhere. How do you get them to use that information so we can actually have a full visibility of that supply chain. That's where the that's challenge is. Exactly. And that's the 80% I mentioned a few different times, right? That's getting an industry to sit down, have the appetite to have these discussions and then agree to a path forward. And those, those conversations can take a long time. So I say for certain processes, there's pockets of adoption, even within specific industries where uh, adoption is better in some areas than others. And it's just around having having those conversations and actually holding trading partners' feet to the fire to actually provide the information that's been agreed to. Great. Really good. Thank you so much. Sure. Along that lines, uh, early on or upstream, one of the apps I saw, I think it was the Global Blockchain Business Council that they highlighted was one from a, a bank in Omaha, Nebraska, First National Bank of Omaha, FNBO is what, what they go by. And they created an app to basically track some of the information um, about, about a, a cat, about cattle based on the hide pattern uh, there. Yeah. So, you know, it, it feels, you know, everyone's trying something different here, trying to figure out how do I capture easily that upstream information um, out there, whether it's an app or whether they're going to write it down or it's going to be some sort of API of, you know, your existing systems, whatever might be out there. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And that's why typically when we talk about GS1 standards, we tend to talk industry specific. So, like I said, I worked on food, food service for a number of years. But for blockchain and just supply chain optimization as a whole, we consciously made the decision like, hey, let's bring all the industries that we're working with together because, you know, Tom, what you just mentioned, there, there's applicability there in, in various industries, right? And so it, it, the idea can still, even if the nuance changes a bit, the idea is still valuable. And that's why we wanted to have these discussions with kind of senior leaders from different industries all coming together. Good, absolutely, good. Any other questions here? Going once. 
going twice. There are a lot of a lot of good questions for Kevin to answer through throughout as well as at the end. As I like, I know when I present, I like uh, having people ask questions. <laughs> well, that way you know everybody was awake. So <laughs> that's always good. <laughs> Not doing email or whatever. Well, <laughs> on it. So uh, Kevin, thank you very much for uh, joining us here today on the fifth of May. Uh, hopefully spring will sprung uh, in the United States uh, more, more quickly uh, for it all. We had a hundred, I think there were 150 or so, Andrea, who registered for this. So uh, there'll probably be a good number of people who will look at the recording uh, here that we're going to have out there. Uh, so we'll, uh, if you guys have listened all the way to the end of the recording, thanks for, thank for staying with us. Uh, folks who joined today, thanks for staying with us also and uh, asking the questions I just talked about. My quick takeaways here um, on it, uh, setting, up the, the, the set, setting up the data sharing is non-trivial. I mean, we probably have all realized that, but also, you know, it's, it no, doesn't hurt to uh, think about the magnitude of it, whether it's five years or two years or um, Renault story a couple years ago talked about six months just to think of contracts set up between organizations. Uh, the other takeaway is this whole upstream push, you know, that, that whole thought there, you know, doing it in the real world there. And then Kevin, a, a plug, give Kevin a shout via his email there, kotto at gs1us.org, if you are interested in learning more about his supply chain optimization cross industry discussion groups there. So with that, thanks everybody again. Enjoy the rest of the day. Andre and Eric, anything that you guys wanted to add in? No, I would love to thank Kevin. Uh, we'll love to thank him for so many insights today. And see you next time. In two weeks' time, we're going to have another meeting. And see you soon again. Beautiful. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kevin. Bye. Bye.